Hello everyone! Welcome to another episode of Reacting Reddit, where real humans read, react, and summarize the world on Reddit for your easy understanding. Today we're going to be talking about COVID in California, because the situation is getting more intense. I understand you may be like, what? COVID getting more intense? How can that be? Or you may just be like, nah, COVID don't exist. Either way, we're going to talk about it. So first, let's remind for context that California is one of the most populated areas, densely populated areas in the United States. And it's one of the hot spots for COVID. There's a couple main hot spots. I'm not saying these are all of them, but the main ones are New York, Florida, California. And there's others, but for the context of this episode, that's what we're going to get into. So California has had issues with the amount of space it has available for COVID patients and other patients. And basically, right now, as of this week, it's capped out. It can't really deal with more patients getting COVID. And at the moment, space is being used from things like hallways, other, other wards, emergency wards are being converted into COVID care areas. They're repurposing space, but they, there isn't extra space and they're, they're running out of things to repurpose. And this is really, really intensely overwhelming the hospital care workers. So there's this that's going on, right? And if you, just for some context, let's look real quick at COVID cases. So let's go to COVID cases, USA. All right, so as you can see, we, we are having a lot more transmission of cases and also a lot more death. Um, previously, like in the, the first wave, so to speak, it was a fraction. We were talking about like maybe 10% the amount of cases that were getting uh, transmitted, right? Death-wise, the most deadly day before is the average day now. So now for the past like week, we lose between 1,000 and 4,000 people a day. And it varies a lot because of the reporting system. In actual reality, it doesn't vary as much. Um, so if you look at numbers, it's always going to be weird because the graphs have so many ups and downs, but the ups and downs are caused because we don't instantly know when a case happens. There's like a system, right, to report it. And a lot of time these offices will submit their reports on like a Wednesday or a Tuesday or every 24 hours or every 48 hours. And that artificially creates those spikes. So if you ever look at the COVID graphs and you see that, that's why it's happening. It's not because there's actually more or less people dying in those peaks it's just because there were missed ones that that number doesn't actually represent that day it represents like some of the previous day as well and it's complicated right so for context the u.s is losing between 1,000 and 4,000 people a day to covid right that's a lot way 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 more than the worst parts of the pandemic even in the very beginning when the u.s was totally totally caught off guard so that's dire. However, vaccines have been made. And at this point, there are multiple vaccines and there are multiple more being created. Unfortunately, there's not, in California at least, there's not enough vaccines for all the healthcare workers. So that's the simplest way to understand the vaccine situation there right now. There's a certain amount of, of vaccines that California has, right? And that amount is less than the number of healthcare workers in the in the state. Now this is a problem because you need to give vaccines to healthcare workers, elderly and to the general population. So the fact that there's only enough for just there's not even enough for just the healthcare workers, that's problematic, definitely problematic. And there wasn't a whole lot of integration between the federal supply chain of the vaccines and the states. So they were just kind of given a bunch of vaccines really quickly. And then they had to have set stuff up beforehand. But most of these states were so occupied by the overwhelming pandemic that they weren't able to take the time to properly orient themselves to be ready to distribute a vaccine as soon as it happened, right? So that's a problem. 
So today we're going to be looking at replies related to hospital workers. And a lot of these are just going to be giving support to hospital workers. Some of them are going to be from loved ones of hospital workers. <laughs> it's interesting how often loved ones are like, strike, go on strike, go on strike, don't, don't work, you know. It's an uh, interesting time. And it, it is odd how before we had like wars and we would send people off to die against their will and stuff. Whereas now, the people who are like on the front line, so to speak, obviously are the elderly. And, you know, they can't do anything about the fact that they're elderly, right? And then there's the people who are taking care of all the COVID patients because they're totally in the front lines as well, right? So the, they're sort of the ones who are making the most intense sacrifice. And right now, you know that there's going to be abuses of, um, of staff and there's going to be management mistakes and it's complicated, right? We don't know how to respond to a crisis until we've dealt with it a couple times. And this is, I guess, a year old now, but, you know, that whole year has been a new experience for most of us. First reply is, this is scary. I feel so bad for all the medical staff. Honestly, more of them should go on strike. Hospital admins aren't doing their jobs, and many people still catching the virus probably aren't doing what they should be to socially distance. I wish my sister would just use all of her vacation or even just quit. She's an ICU nurse. Triage only works if it's actually triage. The second hospitals start considering a person's donation capacity or VIP status, it's no longer triage. Uh, so they're referring to the fact that some, some hospitals are having to like set up areas to do triage because they can't accept regular patients, right? So people will get in like a car crash or something and they'll need to be put in the ICU, but the ICUs fill the COVID patients. So they have to like move people around to make space and stuff. And sometimes that's not possible. And people wait like in hallways and stuff where they're not supposed to. And uh, it, it makes very chaotic situations where medical staff have to be like moving stuff around to get to the things that they normally just can access immediately. And when it's like a life or death situation, not being able to access something like 10 seconds later is enough to make a difference. So uh, it's, it's hard for them, really, really hard. I also apologize that the usernames aren't showing up. There's currently a glitch in the software and it is not showing any of the usernames aside from the first one, which is not what I want. I, I want to give these people credit and everything. So if you look at the original post, you can see their usernames. Cool. Moving on. Since last April, every person that's tried to tell me about the death rate or recoverability of COVID, I've tried to explain that the masks and quarantining and everything is about managing the flow of patients into a healthcare system not equipped for this level of service capacity. It's so frustrating. My grandfather contracted COVID unnecessarily. He died alone in a hospital unnecessarily. And thousands and thousands of people are getting substandard or diminished levels of healthcare response unnecessarily as a result of COVID. It's an embarrassment that as a nation, we can't fire off enough neurons sufficiently to grasp what needs to be done and why. That's an honest assessment. I mean, it is embarrassing and it, it should be. Uh, there, there's plenty of nations that are relatively worse off than the United States, right? Like you could take Nicaragua as an example, right? Nicaragua is in Latin America. It's North Costa Rica south of El Salvador and Honduras, okay? Just so you know where it is, you know it's in Latin America now. Good to know, right? Um, it's one of the poorer countries in this hemisphere, yet living here, I can tell you that most people in the streets, a lot of them wear masks. Like, you see more people wearing masks than not wearing masks. And that was has been true, like, in the very beginning, like, seven or eight months ago, when people here started to be, like, more aware of it. Um, there were less people wearing masks, but people weren't like, oh, your mask shows your political affiliation. It wasn't anything like that. People were just like, oh, there's a disease rampaging about. You need to wear a mask. Masks are cheap here. <laughs> like, even in this country where you only need four or $500 a month to live, like pay your rent, you know, only be paying 100 200 bucks a month in rent, that living living that way that's totally possible here that's how cheap everything is right and people have a hard time earning money here there's not much work at all or not much well-paying work available right 
even these people, even us here, have been able to adapt and most people wear masks and use protections. Even if you want to go into a building, you usually get temperatured and you get your hands sprayed and anytime you get like a shopping cart or something, it gets sprayed with alcohol. Uh, it's surprisingly effective. Like a lot of a lot is done here by a lot of different people, not just the government. And it's been that way consistently since the pandemic started. And this is a country that doesn't have the resources of the United States. And that's also happening in a lot of other countries. And it, it is true that the United States should should be embarrassed of, of how it has handled the, the pandemic because it's denial or the denial of large percentages of its populace has resulted in death and to put it in perspective 9 11 right if you look at like horrific events in in u.s history a lot of the citizens in the united states remember 9 11 and 9 11 you had about as much death as one day one bad day of covid so it's odd isn't it that we have so many people who will get fired up and a whole nation that believed at the time it was right to go to war over that much death, 3,000, 4,000 people. But yet that same nation is full of people. I'm not saying everyone in the U.S. is like that, but that same nation is full of people where that many people are dying every single day of their own country, of their own people. And a lot of them don't care and don't wear masks and don't believe in it and it's sad it's very unfortunate um because it's one thing if they would learn the lesson but the chance of them like seeing death or seeing something that makes them realize the pandemic's real like the covid is too perfect of a pandemic for that that's the problem with it it because it usually is just like you know a really bad cold it's not gonna do more than that usually it's just statistically oh yeah it's actually like four or five you know at least more like four or five times more likely to kill you right that that that's relevant but you know it's still like a cold thing and it's easy to think about it that way but the reality is if something's four or five times more deadly and it's incredibly infectious that's hugely statistically significant and you can't really see things directly unless you're a healthcare worker. So the, I know so many people who don't believe the COVID thing is like, they think that it's this like organization that's trying to convince the whole world basically to control all of them. And all the governments are conspiring together to suppress all the people down with this fake manufactured disease. And it's like, I, I wish that we lived in a country where all of our governments could conspire and work together to suppress us in the same way. That would be amazing. Like, if all of our governments could work together and do anything together, all of them, that, that'd be really impressive. <laughs> a reply to the... Oh, yeah, the mention. So let me, let me get back to this person's comment. So they were pointing out that uh, people often talk about the death rates and everything, but it's not necessarily about preventing death directly from COVID. It's like we can only handle a certain amount of people getting sick every day. Let's say that over a year, a million people get sick. That's handleable, right? Whereas let's say over two weeks, a million people get sick and they all go to the hospital. That's not handleable. And once that happens... That's when you can get truly catastrophic situations, right? As long right now, if you get COVID and you're able to get to a hospital, you're able to get there quickly, you're going to a doctor regularly, you have pretty good chances that you're going to be okay, even if you're at risk, right? I'm not saying you're going to live if you're at risk. I'm, I'm just saying that if you are, if you have good access to medical staff, and you have, you know, good health insurance or whatever you need to have, to have good health care coverage where you are, um, you're probably going to be okay. 
And so will those people who are getting in car crashes, getting in, you know, breaking their legs, getting getting cancer. All these people, as long as they're going to the doctor, they're, they're going to be relatively okay. However, the problem is when the hospitals are overwhelmed because the moment that the hospitals have too much stuff to do, people start getting forgotten, mistakes start happening, accidents start happening in, in exponentially more common ways. It's, it's one thing to try and navigate traumatized patients who need your help right now and balance them against COVID patients normally when you have a clear pathway to everything. But imagine what it's like when there's so much stuff you can't get anywhere without moving something. There's so many people that you can't move. There's too much. There's ambulances sitting out in the front and they can't come in. They keep their patients. But there's calls for more people to get picked up. Those ambulances have to decide this person's dying and sick. We've done what we can. We just drop them outside here. Go leave? Or do we help this person? What do we do? That those are the kind of situations these people are being put in. And I can understand why, from their perspective, it's so incredibly infuriating that people don't take COVID seriously. But people not taking COVID seriously is still a thing. Like, even me as an example, I, I made a video, like, six months ago, and it was just saying, hey, we're in a pandemic, you should think about that. And just think about what that means. Like, you could hurt somebody innocently without meaning to just if you don't wash your hands you need to look at the things that you do and pressure yourself to 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 be better about it right and me saying that that video got like a 90 percent dislike ratio that was literally what the video was about it was just like hey guys COVID is real. People are dying from it. Please take care of yourselves. And it got a 90% dislike. I was like, what? What is this? People just don't like being told that they're responsible for other people's lives. I, I guess I guess there's more to it than that. But And people have so much resentment towards government and crap, and they're not so untrusting. It's really a, a, a scary concoction in society right now. Totally, totally. My cousin, back to reading comments now, my cousin is in the hospital and has been bleeding and his brain is in, is in a coma. The hospital doesn't have the equipment needed to operate on him, so normally they would transfer him to another hospital. They called all the hospitals around them and nobody will accept him because there are no ICU beds available after he has brain surgery. So he's just being left to die until something opens up. Dang, that's harsh. Another reply says, these are the same people who don't understand how a restaurant can go on a two hour wait. The kitchen has a limit to how many plates they can sling. It doesn't matter if you see an empty table in the corner. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. Cause some people, they'll see that there's like, yeah, you won't be able to be sat for like two hours or whatever, but they can see that there's an open table, right? So they'll make a fuss about it. Be like, what about that one right there? And yeah. And you can explain it's like yeah that's just where you sit that's not where they make the food and, and we we don't we were the other part the, the food making part we we can't make enough food yet you know there's there's other people ahead of you and we gotta make their food first so then we can make your food so if you want to if you want to sit in the chair for for two hours maybe we can arrange that but um you won't get your food for a while <laughs> It's an embarrassment that as a nation, we can't fire off enough neurons to sufficiently grasp what needs to be done and why. A reply to that, half the country understands it perfectly well, and for the half that doesn't, it's fueled by a deliberate misinformation campaign that started in the White House. You can probably make an accurate guess of the ratio of people who trust science versus the people who go with their gut by how they voted in the last election. Hey, hey now, we can't segregate people based on who they voted for. Everyone's U.S. We're all U.S. I'm a U.S. citizen too. I don't live there, but I, I'm a U.S. person as well. And whether you voted for Trump or you voted for someone else, you are part of the U.S. The people who support Trump are part of the United States. 
the people who hate Trump are part of the United States. And Trump is a sim symbol. He symbolizes the old way of the United States. And he shows that the way of the white man hasn't died out yet. It still has unfair strength that it shouldn't have. And that's why he was able to get in power. We can say, oh, uh, these people are idiots. Why did they elect him? But that means that we're choosing to complain instead of trying to understand what happened, right? And if you complain about stuff all the time, you're never going to convince anybody of your side or of, to come to your opinion. That's not how you make progress. You make progress with people by listening. If you don't understand somebody, don't talk shit about them. Ask them. Listen. And that's all you have to do. It really is that simple. The problem isn't politicians. The problem is that as a people, we don't listen to each other. And politicians are people, so they have that problem. But it's not limited to politicians. Us failing to listen to each other is the cause of most of our problems in some way. Humans are really amazing. And when we coordinate and work together with the same interests, we accomplish amazing, incredible, powerful things. That's what happens. The only thing that stops that is when people stop working together or they stop listening to each other. So if you're not getting results and you're working with people, that means you're not listening to each other and you're not working together. And you have to work together if you want to get results. And you can hate Republicans if you're Democrat, or you can hate Democrats if you're Republican, but either way, you're hating your own country and you're hurting yourself. Ultimately, you have to understand, ah, oh, okay, I feel this way, but other people feel that way. And the, even, even with Trump, I get that there's so much to be angry about and you want to just hate him because it makes you feel better about yourself. You can just be like, huh, that shithead, that fuck, fuck, fuck him, blah, 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 blah. And it makes you forget that, you know, there's stuff in your life you can do to fix your situations and make better decisions and improve things. And if you're letting Trump consume all your time thinking about that, do you really want to say that over a year you spent a thousand moments in your life thinking about Donald Trump and complaining about him? when you could have spent those thousand moments making your life better or caring about somebody you loved or smiling or petting your cat? You know, there's a lot of better things to do than talk shit about politicians. <laughs> there really is. All right. Whoa, there was a lot of back and forth here. I kind of like this. Okay, they are, uh, there's, a, there, there's a little bit of fighting here. So the first comment that triggered it was someone saying, I blame slate legislators and the hospitals themselves. They didn't want to spend money on this, and now they're taking it out on the people. <laughs> Damn. Uh, so I cut off an earlier part of his comment, but he also, uh, that was kind of in response to somebody blaming the federal government, and then this person was like, no, it was good. It was made in a good way. Blame the state legislators and the hospitals. <laughs> Next comment was, maybe use your neurons to also comprehend that your grandpa was old as fuck and that there's generations of kids who need food to stay alive and a roof over their heads. I don't give a fuck about your family if thousands of others who already struggled before don't even have jobs now to take care of their family. <laughs> Dang, that is an inflammatory comment. Like, really inflammatory. <laughs> that person was just like, I don't give a crap that your grandpa died. I don't care about him because I want other people to be able to work. But see, that's, like, I don't know. Let's talk about the argument. The argument of like, oh, okay, these people have to die because so we can all work. It's like, wait, what's the alternative? Like, what's the, what's the horrible situation here that... You don't work for a bit and you have a bit less money and you're uncomfortable or you get evicted you know what, what we need to be more specific about what the response is too because it's one thing to be like hey look if your grandfather doesn't die then eight thousand families get evicted 
you know, and it's probable that if 8,000 families get evicted, there's going to be a, at least one death caused by that. So they're comparable, right? But what if it's like, oh, all right, your grandfather needed to die so that this one family doesn't get evicted. Uh, at what point is it, like, worth it, right? That's what the problem with these kind of ethical discussions. Like, you can try, when you're arguing with people, you're not going to be able to convince them to feel how you feel. So if, you, if that's your intention and you're arguing, you're just going to get frustrated and you're just going to inflame each other like this person is being. There's no way him being like, your grandpa, screw him, he's dead, well, he was old anyway, and he needed to die. Yeah, that's never going to help. <laughs> Another reply to that said, the reason is not because there is not enough infrastructure to handle the cases. It is simply that there is not enough people to do the work. During the initial phase, there are sufficient staff that can be pulled from states that are not affected. But now, every single state is affected, and there's no more extra pool of people to draw on. If it's only beds, then that's easy. But imagine what needs to go to that bed to make it a functional hospital bed. Yeah, which is the care. That's basically what they've talked about, how, like, in the U.S., there, there is usually the material access. Like, they can make tents with... 10,000 beds, you know, they could set up something that creates big, big tents like that, right, to, to treat these, um, these, these kind of problems when there's not enough space. But that doesn't mean that you have enough staff to successfully deal with all of the people who are in those beds. And the staff is the thing that's hard to scale. It's one thing to get 100,000 beds and cover them from the elements. It's a whole other thing to staff those 10,000 beds. You can't just pull hospital workers out your ass, right? You can pull beds out of your ass if you're a government, but you can't pull trained, qualified personnel because they take ages to produce. So you can't just uh, suddenly be like, oh yeah, we need like 20,000 of them stat. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe you could set up some kind of training program, right? But at that point, it's like, all right, you got to figure out how do you teach 100,000 people who don't know medical care how to properly care for a COVID patient, which is uh, a higher, like a COVID patient is the kind of patient where if you don't respond fast to a vital changing, that could be their death. It's, it's not very forgiving in that way, right? There's little tiny things that you might not notice that give it enough time to take enough of a foothold and then you're screwed. It's, it's harsh, very, very, very harsh. States all across the U.S. that don't have this issue are also completely slammed as a result of COVID. I don't think you are suggesting that. Had California not done this, they wouldn't be overwhelmed at present. However valid this point, it will serve to distract from the primary issue. <laughs> serve to distract from the main issue. Oh, man, that's what most arguments are. <laughs> Distractions from the things they're actually arguing about. There are too many people out there spreading this disease by not taking it seriously. Wear a mask, don't go to the gatherings, limit trips outside, trips outside your home, and get the vaccination when it's available. We can add hospital fund looting politicians to the list of wits and charge that need to answer for the failures during this pandemic and deal with that at a time when doing so doesn't compromise efforts to get the pandemic under control. <laughs> I don't... I want to believe that the U.S. can get the pandemic under control, but it seems like the pandemic's just going to run its course, uh, you know, while the U.S. is trying to get it under control. But once the pandemic comes under control, uh, it, it's too late for it to be because the U.S. was like, oh, yeah, we controlled it. It's more like, oh, yeah, enough people got infected or got vaccinated. Because now it's basically a race to get as many people vaccinated as possible so you can have like more of a herd immunity so that the illness can't spread so easily. But that takes a long time, and that's not the game you want to be playing. <laughs> you know, you want to you wanna be able to, to arm most people with vaccines well before the disease is circulating. <laughs> so if that's not happening, you didn't get it under control. A reply to that says, you're referring to the hospital fee program. 
please provide a source. A, that the fund has been raided to pay for non-healthcare items. I can only find some limited incidents back in 2014. And B, that the hospital fund has anything to do with the current ability of hospitals to respond to COVID. There's no way that the state of the California hospital fund has anything remotely to do with their lack of preparedness for COVID. Well, it could be related, but yeah, you can't, you can't justify it. You can't blame it, right? Works both ways. <laughs> this commenter says, stay the fuck in your home. Happy holidays. <laughs> I'm staying home this year. I've been going to LV for Xmas since 2007. I canceled my plans this year to the out of control pandemic. I'm spending the last two weeks of the year at home, isolating as much as possible. <laughs> hey, me too. Honestly, uh, I'm normally kind of a hermit, but I feel kind of bad, so I hang out with people and reach out to people and stuff. But be, ever since the pandemic started, I've just been like, whew, I gotta ride this and just, I can, it's my social responsibility to stay home and play a lot of video games. It's my ethic duty to entertain myself in my room and stay home as much as possible. You know, so I try and go outside once a day. I go on a walk. My cat's been coming on walks recently, and I don't know how this started, but basically, if I leave my house, my cat always comes outside, and if I turn right, then he comes with me, and we walk around the block, and then I come and I put him back inside because I don't want me, him to follow me to the grocery store because he follows me. <laughs> it's so cute because he, he like runs forward like a dog, and he like sometimes he gets nervous by stuff, and sometimes if there's too much stuff around, like too many cars, it's too bright. Um, it's too loud. He, he doesn't like that. He'll, he'll stay back. But if it's like peaceful, it's calm, it's really early in the morning or really late at night, he's just like, yeah, let's do this. I want to follow you. This is awesome. And that, that has been one of the most joyful moments in, in the past couple of weeks. Like just my cat randomly starting to walk with me was just so cool. And, and what's great is all these random people in the street, they see this like foreigner with this cat following and <laughs> it's so funny it's really funny they laugh so yeah i'm riding that hermit train ride the hermit train guys play video games uh i don't know yeah <laughs> play an mmo that's what you need to do a reply to that points out some people have families to provide for so how about your ass stays home because you're at risk and let the people who are healthy continue on? The world doesn't revolve around you and you shouldn't expect 7 billion people to stop what they're doing to care for a death rate of 1% one, 1 geared towards 75 plus. Yeah, I start scoffing at that because they're, they're dismissing this, this other person. Oh, it's, uh, the other person just said they're staying home for Christmas. Like, it's not like they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not working, right? And then this person said, so how about your ass stays at home because you're, <laughs> oh man. Some people just, you can tell that they've heard an opinion before that they've gotten mad about. And then some new person just says something and the person projects the opinion that they heard from a random other person onto the new person. And it's just sad. Sad, sad, sad. All right. Oh, an inform a, a longer reply. Let's see what it has to say. California never experienced COVID like New York City. Now they are. If your parents live in California, tell your parents to buckle the up now. Cook your own food as much as possible. Don't leave the house unless it's work or grocery shopping. Cancel Christmas and New Year's. Those panicky, paranoid, nutty people are getting right. And you'll be sorry when people in spacesuits are loading up oxygen tanks for your lonely parents in a crowded hospital with people dying left and right. This is reality. Tell your parents now. You're getting welcome. It's kind of a change. Trains. A, cha a change? Why do I keep messing that word up? A weird change. A crazy. An odd change of pace right how your parents used to be the ones trying to worry about you and make sure you were doing the right things to not get hurt whereas now a lot of kids are nagging their parents 
it's it's interesting how COVID has flipped us, you know, made us made us nervous about our parents' imminent deaths, as if we shouldn't have been nervous about that already. <laughs> Look, instead of freaking out and stressing out your parents, like call them, spend time with them. You don't have to see them in person, but talk to them, listen to them, because really, you. You may just not help. Honestly, like if your parents are really stubborn and there are the way they are, maybe they don't wear masks or whatever, or they don't care, maybe they still hang out. Maybe they live in a senior home and they love having orgies all the time and they ain't stopping that. You know, whatever it may be, the point's that they're still your relative and you could give them crap, but honestly, if you give them crap, they're probably not gonna change. They're just gonna get stressed. And, really, once they know how you feel, it's your job to support them. That doesn't mean giving them shit all the time if they truly don't believe something. You can figure out a way to bring it up so they know how you feel, but the best thing you can do is talk to them. Like, have a phone conversation where you ask them how they're feeling and you get them to talk and you listen to them. Because that's what it means to have a connection with someone. And that's the part that you can't do when they die, okay? So if you're terrified of them dying, don't, don't abuse your time that you have now with them by wasting it being worried about them dying. Get to know them. Talk to them. Spend time with them listening, okay? That's what you should do for your parents. If, yeah, if they, they don't wear masks, okay, you can talk to them about that. But if you just try and hate on them, or you get angry at them, or you just think that that's going to help, it probably won't. Maybe there's certain times, if that's never happened before, and you're normally calm, maybe, yeah, maybe. Roll that dice, right? But seriously, spend some time with them. That's what parents really need from you, okay? Moving on. The fact of the matter is, until the state and federal government step up to the plate, staying home is not a realistic option for many people. Being able to stay home is a privilege. Without a shutdown backed by financial aid or direct com compensation, many people need to go out because they need to make money to live. We live in California. Our toddler has only been in public twice since March, and I'm grateful every single day for being able to pull that off. The only time we've stayed in a hotel this year was in August, when everything around us was on fire. And this is a really, it is a valid point that not everybody has the luxury of A, not being able to work, or B, being able to work remotely, or C, already having a remote job, right? Because basically, you needed to either already work from a computer, or your job needed to transition into re remote work in response to the COVID pandemic, or you don't need to work. These are the three demographics that are in a, a more flexible situation, right? But these three demographics don't represent all people. In fact, they don't even represent most people because most people need to work to get the bills paid and to have food. Most people can't just last multiple months without income. And that's why they're pointing out that it's really important that the government helps out so that that can happen. But also, in a lot of places in the world, the government can't, isn't, isn't in a position to do anything. So even having a government that can do something is a luxury. Like here in Nicaragua, like the, the fact that U.S. citizens got $600 once, if Nicaragua gave almost all of its citizens $600 once, that would be like a life-changing, emotional, crazy, insane event to all the people here. That would never happen. They would not expect that, and it wouldn't. It just wouldn't happen. It can't happen. So the fact that even that happened, right? That's a luxury of being a U.S. citizen. It's not a luxury of being a human. It's not a luxury of being alive, and it's not most people. Again, it's not most people. So. I like this comment because we really should be grateful and appreciative of the options that we have if we do have options. And even if you don't have options, like even if you have to work, but you're in the U.S., 
at least there is a chance that your government will give you money again. And it has given you money twice now. So, and before it was even more, it was 1,200 bucks, right? We've been given $1,800 by our government. That's insane for a lot of people. Like in Nicaragua, you only need four or $500 a month to have a good life, but people could live off of like 200 bucks a month. So if every Nicaraguan person was given $1,800, that would fundamentally change the economy in permanent ways. <laughs> like just, I don't know what it would cause to happen, but that is the equivalent of every person not having to work for between two months and a whole year. So just for some perspective, you have a lot of luxuries. If you are a US citizen, you have benefits. Um, be grateful for them, okay? All right, everybody. That's it for now. If you're interested in making this kind of content, please reach out to us. We are looking for other kind of content creators. And if you want to subscribe, suggest a topic, I will make a video just for you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Ciao.